Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram's, Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, Oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I shall gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him and cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated four hundred years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites and Jebusites. Well, good morning and a happy Mother's Day to all you mums. Also a happy Mother's Day to all you who may be mums or maybe are not mums, but also show the mother heart of God very graciously to those around you. Well, this morning I'm going to be speaking from Genesis 15 and I hope it will bless all of us. I also want to give a bit of time at the end for us to be able to respond to God and to receive from him but first let's pray father we just thank you for your word we thank you that we have access to it we thank you for your holy spirit who gives us access to you thank you for jesus who gives us access to you just pray holy spirit would you help us to hear what you want us to hear this morning amen well before we get into the passage, I want to ask you a question. What does it mean for you to have faith in somebody or in something? 
perhaps you can think of a time in your life where it's been hard to keep believing, it's been hard to have faith. Perhaps even right now, it's hard to believe and hard to keep trusting. Well, today's passage is all about faith, it's about righteousness, and it's about covenantal relationship with God. But to give you a bit of context before we get into Genesis 15, we need to just quickly hop back to Genesis 12, because this is where God first calls Abraham. He calls him to leave his country to follow him, and he promises to make him a great nation. So Abraham does that. He follows God. He leaves his country. And we find ourselves three chapters later in Genesis 15. Well, Genesis 15 begins with God declaring who he is and what he's done. I'll read verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So that verse that starts with after these things. So that refers to the events of the previous chapter where God has graciously protected Abraham. He's been his shield. He's given him that battle victory. So when he's saying that, he's reminding Abraham of who he is and what he's done for him in a very real and personal way. These are not just abstract names of God. Because I'm astounded at how quickly I forget who God is and what he's done for me. It's really easy when you're facing trials to forget, to forget. To trust God, you don't even realise that you're not doing it. I've disciplined myself to write in my journal most days. I write what I'm thankful for. I write the things that I feel God might be saying or the things that I see him doing around me. And then periodically I'll go back and I'll recap those things. And I'm always amazed at how much I've forgotten. It's embarrassing. We are like sheep. <laughs> so God uses this approach of beginning with self-declaration before he proposes this covenant relationship. And he uses that same approach time and again in the Old Testament, particularly when he is initiating a covenant agreement with his people. Because God knows how easily we forget who he is and how much he's done for us. And he knew that Abraham too needed a reminder before he made the covenant promise to him, which would require a big step of faith for Abraham to respond. So in this self-revelation and reminder, God says to Abraham, your reward shall be very great. But Abraham, who is celebrated as one of the greatest heroes of faith, he isn't quite there yet. He isn't quite ready to believe or to accept that. I find that quite comforting, that the man who is given the greatest word count in the big list of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, that he still has a wobble of faith here. Reading in verses two and three then, Abraham says, Oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is, uh, is Eliza of Damascus. Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. You see, Abraham here has got his eyes fixed on the problem instead of on God. Now, it's a very real and a very painful problem because he has no children and he's an old man. Infertility is an extremely difficult thing, a very painful thing to walk through. And it'd be difficult in any culture, but particularly for Abraham in this culture, infertility was seen as a curse. And he knew that if he didn't have an heir, then his, his, um, his inheritance would be passed on to his servant, Eliezer. Perhaps there are areas of your life where you're struggling to hold on to hope. Perhaps there are friends or family members that you're still longing to see come to faith. Or there might be a relationship that's still broken. Or perhaps you're struggling to believe that God is there at all. Well, let's look at God's response. Because God is not angry. He's not disappointed in Abraham's apparent lack of faith. 
he is a loving father and he takes Abraham by the hand and he shows him the skies. He shows him the multitude of stars in the sky and he promises him that his offspring will be as great as these. Verses four and five, this is what God says. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. So shall your offspring be. And then we see this change of heart in Abraham. And we don't know exactly how that happened. I mean, we've obviously heard what God says and what he shows him. Abraham has had an encounter with God, which changes him. But he's also been shown the majesty of the creation of God. And something about that perhaps puts his problems into context or just reminds him of how amazing God is, how God is able to do anything and how much more will he care for us. Brueggemann, one of the Old Testament scholars, concludes, Abraham was moved by the awe of the heavens to see how much more concern and power their creator might have to provide for his needs. Abraham did not move from protest and doubt to confession and faith by knowledge or by persuasion, but by the power of God who reveals and causes his revelation to be accepted. Now, after this, nothing really that much changes circumstantially for Abraham. It's actually thought to be over 20 years after this that Abram and Sarah first conceived their first child, Isaac. And actually in that period of time, we are yet to see more actions of disbelief. And it can be the same with us, can't it? We, we believe, we make a step of faith, we choose to trust, and then we go through a difficult time of waiting. And in that waiting, we can have fluctuations in our faith levels, can't we? But in that moment, Abram had an encounter with God, which helped him believe. Because it's when we stay rooted in our relationship with God, it's when we remind ourselves of who he is and of what he's done for us. And we're spending quality time with him. It's then that we're enabled to keep on trusting and believing in who he is. Because God doesn't actually promise that life is going to be easy but he promises that he will always love us and that he will never forget us and he will never leave us. And it's those truths that sustain us through those testing times. So in verse six, after God showed Abraham the stars and promised him these descendants, it says, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So what's that about them? We often think of righteousness as right standing before God or being found without fault before our holy, perfect, righteous God. Because we know that in our own strength that none of us are able to be perfect. Um, and we, because of that, we can't come close to God like two North Poles in a magnet. They can't come close together. They just keep repelling. So when I, but when I think of righteousness... I think of Jesus. I think of him as being the only righteous one to ever live. I think of him as being the, the only way to the Father. I think of Jesus on the cross, dying for my sins in my place, so that I can be gifted with his righteousness, which is what enables me to then draw close to the Father. But this verse about Abraham's righteousness is through faith in this promise and that's just a little bit tricky to reconcile with that salvation with that righteousness we get from Jesus but being righteous with God isn't just about being found to be right and without fault it's a bit more than that so it's about being in right relationship with God and it's about being in right relationship with the will of God so if we think about it in those terms, and it makes a bit more sense to us, doesn't it? Because we see Abraham's response to God in faith um, as a demonstration of his belief in who God is and in what he will do. He exemplifies being in right relationship with God and being in right relationship with the will of God. 
I mean, even still, even still, it's still a little bit tricky to reconcile. And actually reading the different scholars' opinions, they, they mostly won't pretend that we can perfectly reconcile that. However, what we do know is that Abraham, sorry, that God was leading Abraham and later his descendants into relationship with him based on the terms of this promise of this covenant and of the subsequent covenant promises that we see in the, in the Old Testament. Most notable of these is the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Covenant laws. Because through these laws, God makes a provision for humankind's inability to be perfect and righteous. He provides a way for us to come into relationship, or well, for them, we obviously in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, but in, for these Israelites before Jesus had been born, he provided a way for them to be counted as righteous through those animal sacrifices. And those animal sacrifices are like a foretaste of the only one perfect spotless lamb of God, of Jesus, and his once and for all sacrifice that we see on the cross. Perhaps today you need to be reminded of who God is and what he has done for you. Or perhaps you need a fresh encounter with him. We're going to leave some time, like I said, for that at the end. But for now, we're just going to we'll move on with this, uh, this chapter and look next at verse 7. The next part of this interaction between Abraham and God begins again with more self-revelation and God reminding Abraham of who he is and what he's done. Verse 7, God says, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. So Abraham, his response again, he asks another question. Now this time his response is generally taken to be more of an asking of, um, of a sign to strengthen his faith rather than um, an expression of disbelief like it was the first time. He asks God, oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God then replies in the next few verses and he gives Abraham um, detailed instructions of the sealing of the covenant. Uh, covenants were um, commonly used at the time to establish a relationship between two parties. They were like a formal agreement to define the roles and the, um, and the, the two different sides of the, of the relationship. And God chooses this familiar method of defining relationships, something that Abraham would have been familiar with in order to initiate relationship with him. So let's read verses nine to 11. God says, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he, Abraham, brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now this, um, this arrangement or display of cut in half animals seems a bit odd to us in our culture today, but actually that too would have been a familiar kind of um, enactment for a covenant at that time. So probably to Abram, it wouldn't have seen that odd. The point of the animals being cut in half is that the person who's making the promise would then walk between those halves of animals in a kind of way to declare, so be it unto me, if I don't keep to this commitment to this promise that I'm making. And we see later in verse 17 that God himself walks between these halves of these carcasses to declare his commitment to his promise for relationship with Abraham and his descendants. And we see God's presence in this time, in verse 17, displayed as fire in the form of a smoking pot and a flaming torch. Verse 17 says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And then in verse 11, we just have that um, picture of Abraham chasing away those birds of prey. And that just symbolizes him um, defense of his descendants from foreign attack. Now, it's important when we look at this covenant that's being made and set up here in Genesis 15, that we see it in, the, in a slightly wider context, because really it's more like the second of a three part trilogy 
we've got the first part in Genesis 12, when God first calls Abraham, when Abraham was about 75 years old at that time. He calls him, as I said, to leave his home, to follow him, and that God promises to give him land and descendants and blessing. And the third part of this instalment we see later in Genesis 17, and Abraham is by then about 100 years old and still without children. God at that time initiates another covenant agreement with him, or part of the same covenant, an extension of that. Um, and he, he extends it to include other nations, and he makes it an everlasting covenant. The covenant of Genesis 15 just requires a response of faith from Abraham. Whereas in Genesis 17, the outward sign of circumcision is introduced. And also in Genesis 17, God renames Abraham. He gives him the name Abraham, as we're probably more familiar with, which means um, a multitude of nations. And then it's shortly after this Genesis 17 covenant that Abraham and Sarah finally conceive and have their son, their first child, Isaac. And so the promises begin to be fulfilled. Um, moving on towards the end of the passage, in verse 19, we see a list of all the land that God is promising to Abraham and his descendants. Um, I won't read all the names now, but um, it's just um, it's important to note that they are all named, partly because this helps us to see that this was a formal agreement with specific things in mind. Um, but also we just when we look forward into the future, we see that most of this land was eventually realised by the Israelites, but it wasn't actually ever fully realised. And now that was because of the faithlessness of Israel rather than the faithfulness of God because of their covenant infidelity, which recurs over and over again. And the, the time in Israel's history where they see the most realisation of all this land is under the reign of Solomon. We're going back now to the promise of descendants that we see, offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. Well, we see we start to see that fulfilled quite soon um, by Exodus 1, which is about four generations after Abraham. We read in Exodus 1, it says that the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. And then we see an even fuller realisation of this in the genealogy in Matthew 1, where, as we often read this at Christmas, but um, Jesus's genealogy is traced all the way back to Abraham. And then in the New Testament, we also read that Abraham is, in fact, the father of all who believe. Going back then to verse 13, Abraham falls into a deep sleep. And God speaks to him again. He says, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. God gives Abraham a prophecy of the future where he reveals the fate of his descendants for 400 years. As we know from reading on in Genesis and into Exodus, that the people of Israel were taken captive into Egypt and forced to be slaves because they were perceived as a threat because of their number and also put to slave labour for all the building work. But God goes on in verse 14 and he says, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Well, it's okay for us looking back, isn't it? Because we know what happens. We know that God raises up Moses as a great leader and he brings the people out of his out of Egypt, the Exodus, as we say, as we call it. And as they come out of Egypt, he causes the Egyptian people to release up and give them their gold and their silver as plunder for the Israelites to take with them. The prophecy finishes in verse fifteen, where God reassures Abraham that he himself will die in peace as an old man. Well, it's not very often that we see or hear God give um, people a prophecy of that much detail for that much of their lives or their descendants' lives. And I'm not sure that we would necessarily want that much detail a lot of the time. But those Israelites in that time when they were captive in, in, in Egypt, there must have been a few moments at least where they doubted that God had called them and that he loved them. <laughs> 
And so I imagine that that prophecy would have brought them great hope and comfort that he had still called them, that God had not forgotten them. God knew Abraham and he knew what he needed. God knew the Israelites and he knew what they would need. God knows us and he knows what we need. God knows you and he knows what you need. He has not forgotten us. We might not have a 400 year roadmap and we might not even want one, but we do know that God promises to be with us and love us and that is all we need. I want to give some time now for us to respond. I'm conscious we have covered quite a bit and some of it's a bit technical, but what's important for us is what does God want for you to take away or for us to take away today? So I'm gonna ask for you to sit quietly. If you wanna shut your eyes, shut your eyes just so you can concentrate on what God's saying. I'm gonna ask us a few questions. I'm gonna invite the Holy Spirit and let's just focus on what God wants to say to us. Father God, we just thank you that you love us, that you haven't forgotten us, that you have called us to be your people, that you covenant that promise, that covenantal promise to love us and that you are faithful through everything, even through our unfaithfulness, you are faithful. Father God, what truths or promises do you want to remind us of today? Remember, God repeats his promise and directs Abraham towards the multitude of stars instead of directly addressing Abraham's doubts. I'm going to read that quote again from Brugman, who concluded that Abraham was moved by the awe of the heavens to see how much more concern and power their creator might have to provide for his needs. Abraham did not move from protest and doubt to confession and faith by knowledge or by persuasion, but by the power of God, who reveals and causes his revelation to be accepted. I wonder what works for you to see the bigger perspective of who God is, like that stars in the sky moment for Abraham. I'm going to read Psalm 8, which is inspired by this, I think. And, um, and we're just going to ask God to meet with us because he longs to do that. Let's pray. God, we just love that you love us, that you love to draw near to us. And I just invite you now by your Holy Spirit, come and fill each person. You know every single person that is watching this today. You are with each person. Would you reveal yourself afresh? Would you give us a a new encounter with you. Equip us and help us to keep believing and trusting and having faith in who you are, in what you've done, in what you will do. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honour. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands, you have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign God, 
how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.